We have the <laughs> winter is coming. You can tell we had a Game of Thrones watch a time here. And we're going to talk about the next campaign, which could be quite exciting, 2024. Let me do some introductions here. The other, we've got the gray bird, a gray beard <laughs> side here. This is Tad Devine. I've known, we've known each other 30 years. There has not been a Democratic presidential campaign that Tad has not been intimately involved in. Going all the way back. Well, to, a, 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 except for the winning ones. Those <laughs> I, 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 I was in all those. Started with Jimmy Carter? Yes. Yeah, Jimmy yeah. Carter was his idea. Don't blame me. Uh, and worked his way through all of them. Was pretty much the mastermind behind Bernie Sanders' incredible uh, first presidential campaign that almost grabbed the nomination. Uh, managed John Edwards, worked for John Kerry, did all the DNC advertising for Joe Biden's victory. Nobody knows the Democratic presidential primary system and world better. And of course, he's done a lot of statewide campaigns. And is pretty much the key political boss in his home state of Rhode Island. You, you can't get a parking meter moved without talking to him. So uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. John Thomas is a Republican. Oh, the other end. Sorry, I'm switching up. Uh, John Thomas is a Republican consultant, originally from L.A., but uh, media consultant strategy, now uh, based in Dallas, Texas, the buckle on the belt of the Republican Party. Critical, <laughs> critical territory. Yep. My old friend and fellow podcaster here, John Favreau is famous, so he doesn't need any introduction, but runs Crooked Media, which is a, uh, a network of incredible uh, uh, podcasting content, was chief speechwriter to the often tongue-tied and never respected for his communications ability, <laughs> President Barack Obama, and an all-around good guy and excellent for you to be here today. Thanks for having me. Also from Crooked Media, they've rigged this whole thing here. We have We're the crooked. Shaniqua McClendon, who's the VP of politics uh, and is a former USC fellow here. So there we go. And then finally, getting some Republicans involved here, uh, we have Corinne Rankin, who has the most important job in politics right now. Because we're watching how the, you know, the Republicans now have the 218 to have majority, but they're desperate for a few more seats. So it's not a nightmare for potential, probable future leader McCarthy to run. Well, two of, I'd say, the three biggest races are in the Central Valley, where they're still counting votes. No pressure. <laughs> because you are the California Republican Party vice chair for the Valley. So basically, how many seats the Republicans have are going to come down to you? And yeah, no pressure. And we're going to keep an eye on that and, and see and uh, what's happening. So we have a wide spectrum here of experience in both parties. So I'm going to start with the Democrats. We'll work our way over to Republicans because there is a lot going on. Before the elections, the conventional wisdom was that, oh, this is going to be the worst Tuesday in a long time for Joe Biden. The, the House is going to go Republican, which it has, but people expected much bigger margins. We will see where that lands. It's not going to be big. Uh, and the Senate, while more competitive, will probably go to the Republicans. There's going to be a big red wave. And that's going to be so bad for Joe Biden, people are going to be running against him in a primary in two weeks. Instead, the Democrats held the Senate. We don't know the margin yet because we have a special election coming up in December in Georgia. But they, they, no matter what happens there, they're in control. And if you've noticed, and I noticed this in the, in the news footage of President Biden going to meet with President Xi, and we had a pretty good meeting. I think the Chinese were a little surprised and treated Biden a little better than they might have. He had, the president had a little spring in his step. <laughs> so the fundamental question is, I know the president says, like all presidents say, that hell yeah, I'm going to run for a, a re-election, but I'll make a real decision next year. Because you can't say, no, I'm not going to run, because then all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. So we know if he does run, anybody wants to address that can talk about it. But what if he doesn't? He's not 24. Mm -hmm. What does the Democratic Party look like if Joe Biden chooses not to run? What's the primary dynamic? And you know, what's, what's your quick take on it? Why don't we start, Tad, with you? Well, if the president decides not to run, I think it's going to be a free-for-all. There going to be a lot of people uh, competing you know, for the nomination of the Democratic Party. I don't think we know quite yet everybody who's going to be in, but I think it will be a large group of people. I also think we don't know yet 
exactly what the nominating process is going to look like. Having done a lot of these, I will tell you the calendar is one of the most important strategic yeah. objectives in trying to figure out how you're going to coalesce a nominating majority. And until we know whether or not Iowa, which has always been first, then New Hampshire, is going to get booted out, I personally think it is going to get booted out. I think they've had a lot of problems there. I saw them in 2016. I watched them on TV in 2020. And I, and I think they're going to be replaced. If they're replaced by a state like Michigan, for example, that's going to be a very different process. Uh, it's, I think it's going to be a lot harder to boot New Hampshire out. New Hampshire yeah. really, you know, and yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll have a primary this year if they have to, okay, to make sure they're yeah, first. Yeah, just interject. So you know. New Hampshire is written in, in blood right. that if anybody goes in front of us, we automatically move up. So it becomes a race, and you're right. They'd do it next Thursday if they had to to protect yeah. the first. So, so until we know the, uh, the, the calendar, I think it's hard to know the strategy. And the other thing that's happening, too, I'll just end on this, is that the outside money now is driving everything, I think, in politics. There's so much outside money coming in through these super PACs. You know, so if they decide they're going to play in the nominating process of the Democratic Party and people are able to funnel a lot of money in or money decides to follow a candidate, that is going to have a decisive effect, I think, on outcome as well. John, what would be your fantasy football card if the president doesn't, of, of your top three contenders, or four if you want, <laughs> knowing, knowing that, that a presidential campaign is like going through a car wash 300 times? You don't really learn about the paint job till about 290. <laughs> so this is all guesstimate. But you know, at the starting gate, and you can not speak for yourself, you can guess for the punditocracy in Washington. Yeah. But who do you think the big three or four mentioned would be? And will Kamala Harris be in that list? Or is she just not in a strong position in the party? Like a traditional- I, I don't know how strong of a position she's in in the party, but I think she would run if he doesn't run for sure. Right. Um, I, <laughs> it's like you said, the reason it's not just a cop out not picking who my fantasy card is but you got to kind of see candidates in action right you got to see right. how they take a punch you got to see them in iowa new hampshire or nevada and south carolina where, wherever we decide um and before you can really sort of assess their strength I, I took heart from this midterm because in the states that we need to win in 2024 democrats need to win the, the very purple very competitive states Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia. We had strong candidates who won, who in many cases outperformed Joe Biden in those states that we actually need to win in 2024, whether it's Gretchen Whitmer or Josh Shapiro. Um, I think those, those names will be bandied about. I think Pete Buttigieg, Kamala Harris will be out there. I think there'll be other you know red state governors. I think the challenge is like the last three Democratic nominees, Joe Biden, a vice president that had near universal name recognition. Hillary Clinton, maybe the most famous woman in the world. Barack, like Donald Trump, very, very, very famous, right, on the Republican side. I think in this media age, it's a real challenge if you are unknown to break through in a way that, say, Barack Obama was able to break through in 2004 at that convention. And so I think one of the real challenges that any nominee faces, is, particularly if it's someone running up against Trump, is how do you get that kind of notoriety um, and attention in this media environment where it's so hard to stick out. Right. Well, we've learned it helps to be famous. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, big country. So Corinne, from the Republican point of view, who do you think is an operative? And again, your district of California has some of the last swing seats here, like those two races were in the middle. Who do you think the top three or four might be and who are you hoping for? <laughs> Looking at a general election and tough swing seats. Yeah, uh, for president. On the uh, if, if Joe Biden doesn't run, you're any way you want to go with the question. Who do you think the biggest Democratic contenders are, and who do you think is the one you'd fear most as a Republican leader, and fear least of the kind of usual suspects? Well, I happen to think that Joe Biden will run. Oh, we got. <laughs> Hello, microphone. Back Am I back on? You know, you miss one payment to the AB <laughs> unit. <laughs> That's it. Oh, yeah. God. yeah. <laughs> Hi, do we want to use a handheld? Yeah, why don't we run it up here? Or maybe there is one up here. Check the power pack. Yeah. It's embedded. Yeah. It's on. Let's get a handheld oh, yes. mic up here, please. Is it better? I don't think no, so. Going on around. No? There we go. There we go. All right. There you go. There you go. All right, thank you. So I just put that on for nothing. There you go. All right. <laughs> Uh, I happen to think that Joe Biden was going to run again. I just, I don't see 
anyone wanting to challenge him or anyone wanting to come in and sort of break up this, you know, established candidate that the Democrats have now. I think it could probably be a disservice to their party, it could mm -hmm. kind of send them into a little bit of turmoil, a little bit of uncertainty and things like that um, aren't a good thing when you're wanting to take, you know, continue the leadership of the country. We're played consultant bingo here, John. Yeah. What do you think? Who, who's yeah. their strongest and weakest candidate? Well, let me, uh, let me take the be? drool off my face as I, uh, as I dream. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a name that has <laughs> not been mentioned here is our governor in California, Governor Newsom. Yeah. Uh, look, he's going to have a say in this process. He's been positioning. Um, he's not going to go quietly in the night. And I think he has a darn good argument to the progressive left that he was their COVID hero. He, you know, created budget surpluses. He knows, you know, he knows how to hold majorities. Uh, he's fought the good fights. I think he's probably one of the leading, talk about name ID. This is a guy yep. who understands you gotta be relevant and use your position. Uh, now, will that sell in Iowa? Will that sell in New Hampshire? Will it sell in a general? I don't think so, but I think he's, I think he's a star. Yeah, and he's new and fresh. Mm -hmm. And if you're of the theory I often hold that voters like to vote for what they perceived you didn't get last time. Mm -hmm. And Biden bounds down. I, I agree, it's not a primary, but health issues, age, you know, he's he's new and interesting. Um, Shaniqua, you bet clean up on this one. Take a look <laughs> at the party and what do you think the big contenders would be if Joe Biden chooses not to run? So someone mentioned this earlier and I'm really, really biased. But I do think more people should pay attention to Ray Cooper. He is a Southern Democrat. He won in 2016 when Trump was on the ballot. Trump won North Carolina in 2016. He won it in 2022, and um, Ray Cooper was able to win. He's he's not like I don't know a better term for this. Like you know, like a fake Democrat in the South. Like he's right. he's a Democrat. He he pushes for progressive policies. He got a lot of flack around the things he was doing around COVID in North Carolina, but he's still like doing well, and he's done a great job with the state legislature. I just think he's someone that a lot of people like. And I do think he would have appeal that someone like Gavin Newsom might not have, um, you know, throughout the country. Um, and, you know, he's just like a charming, sweet, sweet guy. Um, other than that, I, I don't, I don't know. All of the people who ran in the primary in 2020, 2019, I, I don't see them stepping back into it. Like, I think we got to see kind of where they would fall in a primary and Joe Biden won. Um, I agree. I just think he is going to run. I, as someone who questioned that early on, like John, after the midterms, I think it's really clear that Biden is the person who should want run. And now we see that Trump is back in already. You know, I, I'd feel a lot more steady if we just kind of stuck to what worked last time. It's right. Nice. Do a sequel to the movie that was a big hit last yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of a chicken or egg thing for the Biden people, because I think if like, if it's Biden-DeSantis, I think that's a tougher that's true. matchup yeah. than Biden-Trump. Right. But um, you really can't know that for quite a while. And yeah. I think that Biden is probably going to make this decision relatively soon because you don't want to be just sitting there not and, right. and not right. having made a decision and we're well into the spring and summer. And it seems that the Biden-Trump stack up is on brand for Biden because he ran as this safe hand, safe yeah. keeper message. I'm gonna restore the sanity of the country and the yeah. dignity, yeah. et cetera. I did it once, I'm gonna do it again. And it's it's on brand for him. Mm -hmm. But he's, yeah. he's got a battle against a fresh new face yeah. and questions of competency and all these other things come into play that I don't really think do with Trump. Yeah, and you're, you're on something about Cooper because if you go to the RNC secret room, I don't know if Reince is here, he's probably still got the key. You open up the Nixon portrait and you go into the underground bunker. And what we have stenciled on the roof is never let the Democrats nominate a Southern white Protestant. Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, Al Gore, depending on how you feel about vote counting in Florida, all win. It is the, that's what the computer says is the most formidable candidate. Now, do primary voters think that way? I right. don't know. Let me close out the Democratic section, then we'll get to the fun, juicy Republican <laughs> stuff with the a question for anybody. Maybe we'll start with John just because you kind of had this job. If I were a Biden political staffer, I here's what I'd be kind of worried about. How do we handle this? Because he is 79 years old. Mm -hmm. And we now have a process media that is much more interested in what kind of shoelaces you have than your four point plan. So Biden reminds me of the kind of guy who wakes up one day and as president might have some great, I cured cancer, I got it, I got to hold a press conference. But he looks in the mirror and he's got antlers now. 
Because everywhere he goes, the first media question is, uh, yeah, 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 you cured cancer. What about those antlers? And the antler, of course, is that you're now 80, 81. You know, and I think, how do they work around that? Because it's always there. You know, what, what, what are the tactics and everything to try to not let that take all the damn space so you can go out and sell all your good Biden stuff? I mean, I think it's similar to the strategy they just employed in these midterms, which is to, especially if it's Trump, to make this election about Donald Trump and the threat he poses to right. democracy. And the less the race is about Biden, and the more the races, I mean, it's just, and, and Trump's going to do the same thing to Biden, right? right? But the more that Biden can raise the stakes of the election to make it, it's not about me, it's not about him, it's about whether democracy survives. That's why I'm here, that's why I'm running again. Um, and the more they can lean into that, I think the less you'll get the typical sort of, you know, process questions, stories, questions right. about the age and all that. Anybody else? You, you know, they're going to have to offer some reassurance yeah. on the issue of age if the president yeah. decides to run for re-election. And I'm reminded, 1992, I was Bob Kerry's campaign manager when we ran for president. And people in New Hampshire were concerned about Paul Songus and the fact that he had cancer. Previously recovered from cancer, later died from it. But they were concerned about it. So his campaign put together an ad, and it was about how Songus was a swimmer in the you know older swimming racket. It was just Paul with a much too small bathing suit for those days, OK? <laughs> Jumping into the pool, doing yeah, his butterfly yeah. stroke. And the purpose of that ad was to reassure people that Paul Songus was okay and that yeah. cancer was okay. The Biden people are going to have to do some stuff like that to reassure yeah. people that he's not an old guy walking across an icy crosswalk, okay, right now, <laughs> that he's going to be okay and he's going to be able to have the capacity to serve as president. Yeah. Maybe one, one word, unicycle. <laughs> unicycle. Yeah. Stay tuned. I don't think we have to look much further than last Tuesday. The electorate's okay literally electing a senator that can't yeah. speak, I was that gonna has say. had a stroke, that is physically incapacitated. <laughs> Biden pretends like he's not physically incapacitated. Fetterman admitted that he was, and the voters were okay with that yeah. because of the alternative. So, yeah, well, they, 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 are, they were comfortable with a guy who can't speak because they're more concerned about what the other guys are saying. Well, okay, the that's yeah. the problem. Yeah, Oz right. managed to be worse. You know, yeah. right? you know if you, you're killing 300 kittens or whatever, you know, he managed to get into contention. <laughs> but I thought Fetterman had the greatest line of the campaign, just as a matter of flagrant. I'm going to get better. This guy's going to still be terrible. I and, thought that and live in New well. Jersey. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know. All right. All right. All right. Cheap partisan. <laughs> Sorry. Well, look at the, <laughs> hey, the exit poll said more people were concerned about the fact he lived in New Jersey than were concerned about Fetterman's health. That was the exit yeah. poll in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Corinne. I, I, would, I would tend to agree. I don't think it's going to be an issue. Um, it was an issue uh, that was raised in the 2020 election and you know the, his strategist decided to keep him out of the media and not let him have as many gaffes you know as they like to call it and you know on, on the other side on the republican side we would always joke that they're hiding joe biden in the basement he's running a campaign from his basement and it seemed to work yeah it in did. fact, that could be the strategy. Maybe they put him back in the basement. Make it yeah. about everything but Biden, which is kind of what happened in the midterm, which is such a crowbar job. It is so hard to make a midterm not about the incumbent president. It's, yeah. it's a real hat trick. So that's a good transition to the other side of the coin, the Republicans. Um, you know, I, I've been a screaming anti-Trumper since 1993. Uh, I was running politics for Christine Todd Whitman into governor of New Jersey, and Trump was down in... Atlantic City, young version of Trump, getting in all kinds of trouble. And uh, so I had a little experience in that area. And so I was very vocal uh, publicly all through the Trump thing. And then I found somehow my phone number has been rediscovered by so many Republican friends since the election. Uh, we have tried three times the Trump brand in a general election. It's a formidable mm -hmm. brand in a Republican primary. Mm -hmm. But in a general election in 2018, a lot of wreckage. 2020, now ex-president Donald Trump, though he'd disagree with that, more wreckage. Now, even more wreckage. And, a, and a, a, a year that under all the metrics, we should have easily won both houses. So the question is, what is your take on President Trump is now an announced candidate, mm -hmm. um, on his chances to be the Republican nomination nominee. There's one theory that Trump is Rasputin. You can stab him. You can set him on fire. He's indestructible. He'll never stop. And the other theory is, I, it's funny, I did a, a speech in Salt Lake City, not, not exactly swing territory, um, yesterday. 
with a bunch of uh, state directors of local trade associations in the restaurant business. And afterward, all the Republicans from the big Republican states pulled me aside. And they've all, just being professional Republicans dealing with state, they all have you know, red hats. Those red hats are now in the drawer. Mm. And they're all like, what about this Glenn Youngkin? What about DeSantis? <laughs> I think he could be. It is amazing. And I think you and your Republican lives are probably feeling a little mm -hmm. of this. How much interest there is, not in trashing Trump, but in moving on. Mm. So we start with... Uh, John, why don't we start with you and then Corinne. What, what are you hearing out there in the sure. primary world? Has it changed? Are we underestimating the Donald staying power? Or do you think we're, we're looking at a very different Republican terrain than we had a few months ago? You know, I think the, the earth is shifting as we speak underneath yeah. us on the Republican electorate side. Uh, in full disclosure, I think I'm running the, the leading Ron DeSantis super PAC for president right now. So, yeah. uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a biased actor here. But there's an important distinction of what's occurring, I believe, which is, uh, unlike you being a never Trumper from the '90s, right. Right. I was a very pro Trumper. I was pro Trump in '16 in the primary. I was pro Trump of '18 and '20, but I'm pro winning more than I am pro Trump. <laughs> right. And right. and that's what we're seeing. I think happen in the Republican yeah. electorate, Mike. It's not so much that people are saying, "Oh, well, the Republicans all of a sudden don't like Trump." No, no, they like him, yeah. but they want him to switch from a party leader to a party elder. There's an important distinction, and the question yeah. is, you know, what is Trump's, you know, vote floor, or vote, like what of that cult? How many of them are are his ride or dies, or how many will defect? And we're already seeing in early polling that people are willing to make that switch, and we'll see yeah. if it sticks. Yeah, I mean, even before the election, Tony Fabrizio, who was Trump's pollster, did an interesting poll of Republican voters, not all primary voters, but. Re Reliable Republican voters. Do you like Donald Trump? Damn right, 86% favorable. Great, should he be our nominee next time? Brrr, boom, 45%. Yeah. It's like, oh, I love him, but you know, we can always, the future, new. So, Corinne, what are you feeling out there in the, that key swing territory of California as a Republican leader? Well, again, it's very early. So there's a lot of sentiment that, you know, yeah. former President Trump made his announcement very early on. And the thing about Trump supporters and Trump voters, is they're very nuanced. Uh, there were a lot of people when he came out in, in 2015, 2016 and made the announcement and all the, half the Republicans just loved him and thought he was the greatest thing since sliced bread and the other half were never Trumpers. And you saw that that didn't stop him. And he kept going. And we always have this joke that he won the 2016 with a plane and a cell phone. And so he, you know, it's very early. So we'll just, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But I wouldn't count on the Republicans who don't like Trump to stay in that lane if Trump continues, if he does a couple of um, maybe course corrections from 2020 and starts to, uh, run on his uh, accomplishments when he was in, when he was the president, and stops with the the 2020 deal. And you know, I didn't agree with it when when Hillary Clinton said Russia stole the election, and I think the Democrats went on with that for four years. And I didn't necessarily agree with with uh, President Trump when he said the election was rigged. And ha I, I think that on both sides that that has to stop. Um, but if he continues to go on and, you know, his speech that, um, that he recently gave to announce his candidacy, he didn't necessarily go into that. So, like I said, it's very early. So we'll see how it plays out. And I think that a lot of Republicans are sitting on the sidelines waiting to see how it plays out. Besides, I think Gavin and DeSantis want to go against each other <laughs> when it's an open seat. <laughs> one day. There's an interesting polling number that NBC has where they ask people, Republicans, are you more a supporter of the Republican Party or are you more a supporter of Donald Trump? Back in the first quarter of this year, it was 54%. I'm a supporter of Donald Trump. 35%, I'm a supporter of the Republican Party. The brand new one, 62%, I'm a supporter of the Republican Party. 30%, an almost 50% decline. You Democrats, you're going to enjoy this. Republicans <laughs> having a switchblade fight at three feet uh, over, over Donald. As veteran political observers, any one of you guys start, and then I want to hear from everybody. What, um, how do you handicap this whole Trump thing we're about to go through? So I think you get to see how the primary takes shape, how many candidates there are. I think the dynamic on the Republican side that's interesting in the primaries is, of course, you guys have winner take all and it's not proportional yep. so trump 
if it's a crowded field, 35, 40 yep. percent, he can he can win some of these states. And that might right. be and, that and 35 to, to 40 percent might be the cult. Just to clarify, because it's really important. The Democrats all cried when old Yeller died. So they have a system where you come in third, you still get a few delegates, a participation trophy. <laughs> we mean Republicans are like, you come in second, beat it, loser. No delegates for you. <laughs> so that means if you start with the solid plurality at the front, you can run the table. Now, if 27 Republican states have state meetings and the RNC moves up the limit, not that we've been looking at the bylaws. Uh, the Republicans are starting to wonder about proportional, because yeah. that's the one thing that Ron DeSantis, Larry mm -hmm. Ogan, Josh Hawley, and mm -hmm. the Republican Ted, Ted Cruz, there, there's some interest in that. Uh, so that you're right. That is the key Trump advantage in the rule book, and don't think people aren't looking at changing it. And look, I think if, it, if all these other Republican potentials dropped out and it, it was going to just be Trump and DeSantis, mm -hmm. Then I think it's an interesting race, and I, I could see DeSantis winning that. But, you know, you start having Larry Hogan and Pence and all these other people in there, they're going to start pulling votes from DeSantis, mm -hmm. and then you have the Trump show again, and you have him and 10 other people on stage, and he's doing his thing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, the system, I mean, if the Republicans had the Democratic system of proportional representation, and I was, the reason we have that system is in 1988, I negotiated it on behalf of the Dukakis campaign because Governor Dukakis wanted it. He was a Massachusetts progressive. They had proportional representation, and Jesse Jackson wanted it too. And we got to make peace at the convention by giving it to him. And, uh, and I also felt, as I told the governor at the time, that it was the best way for an incumbent president to be renominated. So why don't we get it in there? The Republican system is very different. You know, you win a, a small victory victory and you get all the delegates and, and Trump could be in a position to do that if everybody runs. But as a Democrat, I want to tell you, I, you know, I, at the beginning of my political career, I was at the Carter campaign and all of the hierarchy of the campaign were in a room literally opening champagne bottles with the nomination of Ronald Reagan. The one guy they could beat, except he didn't beat him. Okay. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, and, and so I think you better be very careful. You know, Trump, he, he's a pretty wily guy, and uh, you know, I think if, if he runs, we're going to have to really run a tough campaign to, to end his political career once and for all. Yeah. Uh, Shaniqua, what Corinne said, I've heard from a lot of Republicans. If, if Trump can tone it down a little, if he can become a better message candidate. So they, they quaaluded him or whatever for his announcement. You know, <laughs> they took him way down. Yeah, yeah, it's a big elephant one. Um, <laughs> All right, non-impartial moderator questions. <laughs> Send your angry email to Bob Schrum at the USC Center for the Political Future. But the point being, as somebody who's observed a lot of politics, you think Trump can be changed that way to be a more rational candidate? Can he be handled? I think Tuesday happened, and then he announced he was running, and he had that in his mind. I think what we saw this week was him reacting to that and understanding that all the advice he was getting to, to calm down and not be the crass person, the crass person that he normally is, I think he took that to heart. I don't think he's that disciplined. Like, I don't think it's going to last long enough. Um, I think, I don't know how long it will last, but I really feel like in the next few weeks, he's going to be back to him, old, his old self. He's going to start having the rallies. He really feeds off the energy in those rallies. And I think you're going to see the person that we saw, we saw from 2015. Um, I mean, I guess we never stopped seeing him since 2015. Um, yeah, um, I could be wrong. Um, I also think once other Republicans get into the primary, now, you know, before he gets to Joe Biden or whoever is running on our side, he has to go through them. And now they're his enemies. And he's going to start attacking them the way that he does um, everyone else. We've already seen he started... He already has a nickname for Rick De or uh, Ron. Ron DeSantis. <laughs> Sorry, Ron De Sanctimonious. Uh, yes. Pretty good. It's yeah, good. I mean, yes, it, it was good. Um, and he just is able to make caricatures out of anyone he's up against. And I think that's something that his core base of voters it excites them. Like he's someone who's strong and is going to like stand his ground and defend them. Um, and I, like, will people? Will other Republicans show up in the primary? You know. Um, I would like to think they would. I always tell people you can't complain about the general if you didn't right. do anything in the primary, but they may just be sick of it. And um... Mike, yeah. one thing that struck me on announcement night that I think is going to be dramatically different for Trump this time versus 2016 is how the mainstream media treated Donald Trump on announcement yeah. night. The yeah. fact that I was watching Sean Hannity cut away mm. mid-speech from yeah. the president, yeah. I almost fell out of my chair. Yeah. The, the idea that that could have happened in 2016 or 2020 is blasphemous. 
Yeah. But the the media in general, e even you know Murdoch properties, you know Murdoch property on New York Post, bottom announcement, bottom mm -hmm. of the page, right. Florida man announces run. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just a different level of mm -hmm. treatment, yeah. which I think is the National Review tearing his face off. It, the memo has gone out from Murdoch Central. Clearly. Yeah, I, it's mm -hmm. it's interesting. I think there's two levels of like guilt in the mainstream media right now. You know, the the more kind of you know, the CNNs and the MSNBCs that feel guilty in the sense of shame that they made Donald Trump by giving him so much attention. So they're they're naturally, even though he rates well, I think they're going to be inclined to claw, pull back a little bit. And then the Fox Newses of the world that are like, we don't want this guy anymore. Yeah, right. But I think yeah. the people who love him are going to find him. Like there's, there's OAN, there's these other yeah. places where his core group of people are going to be able to find him. And, I, you know, we'll see, but I think that's enough. Like if too many people get into the Republican primary, I think those other little, I don't even want to call them under the radar. There's enough people tuning into these um, news networks. I think they'll get all they need from there to like really push him over. Um, I do think the number of people in the primary think, matters. I think it was interesting when Fox News cut away too, it was to turn to Mike Huckabee and Pete Hegseth to just lavish praise on Donald right. Trump. So I do like, and, yeah. and all the pundits yeah. on Fox that night were just talking about how wonderful he was, how wonderful the speech was. I started thinking maybe they cut away to help him because they knew the speech was so boring. <laughs> so you might as well have some sycophants <laughs> on to praise him. You know? Listen, if, if Trump starts beating Biden in polling head to head, yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, uh, and yeah. if the ratings for the networks of Trump being on TV start to come in hot, okay, yeah. coverage is going to change yeah. and the mood's going to change about Trump. It's, okay, it's, that's just what's going to happen. All right. Same reality for DeSantis. Yeah, he's yeah. having a little surge now. He's beating Trump in a lot of Republican early mm -hmm. bumpish. The, the Cruz guys did a poll, so they, you know, they're <laughs> talking their book a little. My friend Chris Wilson, but still. There's some evidence now. It's been true in Florida for a while that among the voters who've been to both Trump Burger and DeSantis Burger restaurant, they like the DeSantis Burger mm. best. They're the, they're the voters who've been exposed to both of them the most because uh, Trump essentially is based in Florida and DeSantis, of course, being the governor. But DeSantis is quite capable of having a 44-46 poll with Biden any minute now. Mm -hmm. And I think the same effect yep. could work there. I, I can't tell you... Again, it's a very small sample, but 14 professional repubs from big R states pulling me aside. It was all DeSantis except for two young kids, the governor of Virginia. Nobody, wow. nobody. They were all like, what do we do about grandpa? I was surprised because I've known some of these people and they were, they were totally comfortable with Trump three years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Democrats, who are you most afraid of running against on the Republican side? that actually has a chance to win the nomination. I assume the default Democratic position, correct me if I'm wrong, would be, yeah, let's do a rematch Biden versus Trump. We know the playbook, we've won it before, but if you don't get Trump, then, uh, then if you're a Republican, <laughs> pretend you're a Republican for a day. <laughs> uh, I know it's painful. It's not possible. I belong to two <laughs> labor unions, believe me, and I, I, have to, I have to get a lot of medicine to work with that. Uh, but who would you, who would you pick if you were head of the RNC, Ryan's over there wants to know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think, I mean, in terms of who's actually going to get through that primary, right? Yeah, because of I think DeSantis is, yeah. a, is a strong candidate. Listen, yeah. DeSantis raised $215 million. Okay. That's a lot of money. Right. And, uh, you know, Florida's a lot of electoral votes. And the guy's obviously a smart guy, you know, despite right. what, what he says, <laughs> you know, because he says it for a purpose. But um, he's got, you know, you got to consider him formidable. But the, the person I would worry about, most about is someone who re, we really don't know yet, who comes right. into the process right. and has something that can help you more than anything in politics, a message, okay? Yeah. And goes to New Hampshire or Michigan if it comes up, and Nevada, and you know, South Carolina, and delivers that message and the public begins to move towards it. That's who I'd be afraid yeah. of. Yeah, because the process can create a stuff. Yeah. That's right. But I think that just as Democrats were so focused on electability in 20 in that primary, which right. ended up benefiting Joe Biden, I think Republicans yeah. will be so focused on electability that if DeSantis's message is simply, I'm the more electable Trump, I'm everything you liked about Trump, except I'm electable right. and look what I did in Tastes Florida, great, less filling. then that's all he needs is a message. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the clearest uh, lesson that Republicans learned last Tuesday was, you know, Trump is a liability. And to me, uh, you know, no offense to anyone, I, I think the only thing that they really respond to is power and winning. And up until Trump, the whole time that Trump was useful and was able to win elections, everyone was, you know, his friend and happy to have him. 
Um, and the minute he wasn't, no one was anymore. So I, yeah, I, I think that DeSantis is probably the best option for that because he is smart. Like, I know he kind of, he's a good politician. I'll say that. Um, I, I think that he's a lot smarter than he comes off as, as a politician. Um, I think that's why he's able to connect with a lot of folks. Um, but I, I do think he'll be probably, you know, a really hard person to beat because he's he's disciplined. He's mm -hmm. going to stay on message. Um, he knows how to get his base excited. But I think he'll also figure out a way to appeal to people who are very turned off by Trump. And, you know, we'll have to figure out how to. Here's a little DeSantis him. story, because I I'm for anybody but Trump. You bring Mussolini back from the dead. No. I'm interested in hearing the pitch. Uh, but. The, the, the Santos is doing great right now, but it's also, there's a long history of doing great this early. Mm. Yeah. Nowhere to go but down. Yep. The second look, as we call in politics, can yeah. be bad. The DeSantis staff is extremely happy that for the first time at a hurricane event, they got him to some guy who lost his house to tap him on the shoulder and touch somebody because he's not a retail politician. Mm. And New Hampshire exists to eat front runners like that. Right. But New Hampshire isn't nearly as powerful as it used to be mm. in the process. What are you hearing, both of you, uh, Corinne, John, in the, <clears throat> the activist circles you're around? I mean, I'm sure in the Central Valley, it's all about can we pull off these tight congressionals, but what right. candidates have In support? the Central Valley, we can't even think about what we're doing for Thanksgiving right now. Yeah. Yeah. So this is <laughs> far looking. Um, I don't know. You know, it's, I've, I've sort of tossed this around. I'm starting to struggle with the idea of, you know, what if DeSantis was. I just... I, I don't see it. He was just elected in Florida. He promised Floridians four years of being their government. Did he? So he promised the Floridians running for governor, accepting the nomination, and, and he's very well liked. I just I've recently spent some time in Florida and DeSantis is well liked throughout the state. There's DeSantis signs everywhere. And another thing is he's very popular with Latinos, especially in Florida. I mean they're you know, the Latino community is very diverse. And so in Florida, you see a lot of like uh, Cubans and you have Haitians who aren't so Latina, but they're, they're fleeing Cuba, they're coming. And so they really believe in the American dream. And, and DeSantis has been able to tap into that in, in such a special way. So, you know, I would agree that if a DeSantis was to run against Joe Biden, Joe Biden would be in trouble because he, he does have that popularity with the Latino, he does have the Latino vote. Um, I just don't see him doing that. There would have to be a lot of backroom conversations in order to somehow smooth that over for a uh, DeSantis uh, 2024. But for right now, I just don't see it because we have to remember if we if you go back, um, DeSantis was not polling well and he was not doing well in the beginning when he first ran yeah. for governor and it was Trump who came in and gave him an endorsement and helped him campaign so you know some people you could say Trump you know pretty much made him so is he going to turn around That's now and go against say, you know? well yeah. some people with Trump yeah. some other people I, would, would m might say that Florida hand, I point out DeSantis was also very lucky he's had two very weak Democratic opponents He's never had a real Democratic superstar go at him. But it doesn't matter if you win the lottery and get a weak opponent and beat him big. Well, when is Gillum win? was a weak opponent? Who? Andrew Gillum was a weak opponent? I think so, yeah. yeah. Last month of that campaign was all Gillum scandals and everything. I mean, mm. you know, feel free to disagree, no, but I, I'm not going to disagree. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, in the old days of Florida, Democrats could bat bigger than that. They used to. They used to win all the time. Been a while. I mean, I love hearing the argument. I Look, I think it's a, it's an definitely one we're hearing from activists as well, that, you know, Ron DeSanctimonious, right? Trump made him, he owns him. The last time I checked, endorsements get traded a lot in political campaigns. I didn't realize it was in exchange for lifetime ownership of your political <laughs> career. Like, I'm not sure that's fair. And I also, for, for some reason, I forgot that Ron DeSantis was a member of Congress before Donald Trump ever was political. Yeah. So this idea, uh, it's a cute talking point, but I but it's a real talking point it's and, and, and it's a real one of concern. I think the fundamental issue though, and this is what I'm hearing from activists, which is getting to that core print question of who can win in 2024, we'll pick that guy. Mm -hmm. And an and interesting point of distinction, you know, a lot of people think that, well, Trump was just so popular in 2016, 
People didn't care. They just loved him so much. But Republican voters in 2016 loved what they heard from Trump, but they also thought he could win in 2016. So they were both were in alignment. I don't think Trump has addressed that viability question yet. Is there another name besides DeSantis that's bubbling up? Ted Cruz is out trying to run. Huh. He's trying. He's <laughs> yeah. got a buzz and a half-point plan. Nobody likes Ted Cruz. I would love for Ted Cruz to run. Captain Charm. You know, yeah. Youngkin. Oh, Youngkin, that's Youngkin. another name. Yeah, that's uh, Mike Pompeo. Right. Oh, God. Uh, what about right. Mike Pence? He's making a big yes. media push right now. <laughs> okay. He's got an evangelical <laughs> base. Go I so think well. people underestimate him. He's got an evangelical base, a base of people who wanted him hung. Yeah, I just... Well, that sounds like the makings of a primary. <laughs> <laughs> Flies like him, we know that from All the right, debate. Well, let, me, so. let, me, let me go on to the, 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 good, the big secret question, but it's really important. If We're trying to make it unborn. During World War II, the number one priority of the German Air Force was to protect their synthetic gasoline plant. Uh, no gas, no war. Money. Money mm. in politics here. Uh, now that Donald Trump has announced his candidacy, the Republican National Committee can no longer pay all his legal bills. So that's one money issue. Second, he has a super PAC with 100 million, 90 million, pretty right. big cash yeah. balance. That if you go to the Republican National Committee and get some of the direct mail people drunk, they'll be like, yeah, he's sucking us dry with the small donors because they'd rather yeah. give Trump money than the RNC. Well, that super PAC now can't coordinate with them anymore. You know all about this. You've got a DeSantis a super PAC you've started. And a lot of the Trump staff have gone over the super PAC because one, a lot of money to pay themselves. And two, it's illegal to talk to Donald Trump and have anything thrown in. It's a pretty good life for them. So now Trump's committee has to go raise a bunch of money. Trump has a history of low dollar fundraising. Mm -hmm. But I read an interesting clip in the... Uh, New York Times, and I've heard this on the, because uh, I'm the idiot who, you know, blew 110 million on the Jeb Super PAC, so I know all about this <laughs> Super PAC yeah. thing. Um, of the kind of poll of usual suspect, big Republican, large Super PAC donors, it's like 0 and 4 for not Trump right now. Mm. Perlman, a bunch of them are walking away. And a lot of the mid level Republican finance world is walking away. Mm -hmm. He has a couple, but I'll start with you, Ted, because yep. you've been to this plumbing and wiring world, and then anybody else wants mm. to jump in. Is Trump going to have some money problems here? Well, you know, I think he could. I mean, I, I think in 2024, the super PAC is going to be the dominant force in the presidential campaign. They haven't been yet, but I think they will be. They're going to be because, you know, you can just see the impact they're having now. There's so much money being poured into them. They can take unlimited amounts of money. They can do it in a clever way and not disclose who's do donating it. And, and so I think that's where the money's going to go. And I, and I think if that happens and you've got these super PACs showing up with 20, 30, 40 million dollars per state to go in and take over paid media, you know, that's going to determine the outcome more than anything else. And so, so I think that's what we're looking at. So then that means, well, who are these people who are putting the money in? And it's either a few people who write very, very large checks. I would have said it was going to be the crypto people, but they're all going <laughs> broke right now, you know? But they were, they were definitely on that trajectory. Yeah, and that guy was a Democrat, right? He was the sure great hope bank. Yeah, yeah, well, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's on hard Not times anymore. now, but. He'll be investigating the criminal justice system from the inside. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's not a close look at it. But, but when you come in, with that kind of money, you can really take things over. And unfortunately, our system right now is set up for it. It is just corrupt as can be. It's owned by special interests, and they're going to try to buy the presidency in the next election. I know, John, you want to jump in, but just I'll add something to the conversation. You guys can all react. When you're in a super PAC, the candidate can't communicate with you, and Trump's a control guy. Right. Uh, his super PAC is going to drive him crazy. Because he's gonna, he's gonna call them up. You know, there will be the next indictment because he just won't let them operate independently. Super PACs can be a source of frustration to the candidate campaign because they can't control it. Um, what, what do we think about Trump and money? Do we think he'll be as successful this time? Does he not need it? You know, he had a plane and a, and a Cell microphone. Phone. <laughs> what do we think? Well, Corinne, why don't we start with you? And then, John, is somebody running a super PAC, you can chime in. Well, I believe, it, if I'm not mistaken, I heard Rana on Fox News say that uh, Trump's legal bills were upwards of $2 million range as of right now. I, I personally think that that's something Trump can take on, handle himself, which would not be such a big deal for him. Um, I have a feeling they're going to grow, but yes, <laughs> he's got money. <laughs> 
He's got his own his own right. money, so I I don't I just I don't think maybe if somebody else that might be ha might have a big impact, but I, I don't think it will have an impact on him. Well, uh, I've been hearing uh, from small dollar email vendors uh, that I do some work with over the last couple months that the Trump files are usually piping hot, have uh, really dampened down in terms of their yield and return. Mm. Mm. Uh, now that can all change. I mean, Trump has a real talent at generating intensity and enthusiasm in his base. And if he's able to turn that around, we'll see. But it's it's definitely slowing down to date. So he's not going to be able to rely on small dollars, at least as of today. He, a lot of the big dollars are, yeah, you know, well. at, at best slowing down to see what happens at worst are jumping ship. Uh, look, I think if Trump shows that he's inevitable and incredibly viable at some point in this mm -hmm. process, the money starts coming back mm -hmm. his way. Uh, but uh, today, but the question is, does he get choked off financially before he even but, gets to turn that viability around? Do you think, I'm just really curious to see how a primary plays out when he gets to say, before it was all the Democrats were out to get me, and now even the Republicans are. And I, I just have to imagine that his base is really going to respond to that, like, you know, because he is this superhero to them. And now I, I guess he could kind of turn into a martyr. And they're just going to want to, like, support their man and get him out of the primary. Like, I, I don't know. I think these folks are going to, they would sign over a lot for, for I, Trump. I, I think it depends on, you know, who's doing the attacking, who's the messenger there. You know, if it's, uh, if it's very establishment-like figures, maybe that's the case. If it's a bright young star out of Florida, maybe it's a it's a different you know, it's a different way no. to do it. I think that happened in 2016 too. Though Trump yeah. came out and said, you know, the Republican establishment doesn't like me, the yep. Democrat yep. establishment doesn't like me, and that's because I'm for the people. Mm -hmm. I'm for you. They don't like me because they don't like you. That worked really well for him. So I, that's why, you know, I'm I'm a Republican. I'm, I sit on the board of the California Republican Party. So whomever the nominee is, I will support 100 percent. I'm just sort of like to be a counter to just remind people that a lot of people counted Trump out in 2016. Yeah. So you just you, yeah. and always be on your toes. You I mean, <laughs> don't also, be surprised. He also can command attention like yeah. no one else, which yeah. is why you need all that money. And so exactly. I think I think, you know, the combination of what Tad said about the super PACs, what Janiqua said about him sort of, you know, turning the uh, establishment uh, defection from him into his advantage and sort of juicing the grassroots fundraising and saying that, like, you know, painting DeSantis as part of the establishment, painting all these billionaire donors as part of the establishment, they're all after me. Then he can get some grassroots money. And every time he goes in front of a microphone, he's going to get covered. Right. No, I think that's his best play. Mm. So, John, let me ask you, if you hit your head the other day <laughs> and you thought, oh, God, this whole Obama thing, what a mistake. How will I ever atone for it? I got to go help Trump. Yeah, cool. Oh, what would you? Yeah, and you know, we're doing the nightmare scenario. <laughs> <laughs> what, what advice would you give within the realm of Trump doesn't take advice? But what what plays would you try to break over the summer to have Trump have a bit of a comeback? Because the spin on Trump now, not just the national media, but in the Republican middle and leadership class we don't yeah. know about the grassroots we're learning is awful right what, what what does trump do what's the smart way to use the calendar here i mean here's the thing i think i don't know about the calendar but i think message wise you saw last tuesday night in that very long boring speech sort of the seeds of what his advisors are trying to do which is sort of recapture the 2016 magic like forget about 2020 <laughs> but in 2016 part of the appeal was I'm this anti-establishment guy fighting the establishment. I'm this populist. I'm for you. You even heard him last uh, in the in the speech say, you know, this campaign's not going to be about me. It's going to be about all of us. I think that was a very self-conscious <laughs> line that they jammed in there and made him say because yeah, later he fired that speech. Right, exactly. Yeah. No, I think Trump, they they know that Trump's big weakness is that Trump went from you know uh, he talked about America first, but it was Trump first. It was all about Trump. Right. And the more he can make it about the grassroots, the people, what Joe Biden's doing, you know, and, and make it return to those sort of populist roots, the better for him. The challenge there, though, is the guy was president for yeah. four years, right? <laughs> right so he's right. not this anti this establishment outsider anymore. Um, but I think anything he can do to sort of recapture that profile is probably going to be helpful you, for him. You know, like something we haven't discussed, I think that is probably Trump's greatest strength in this process is that the Democrats want Trump. Mm -hmm. And so the Democrats and their machine are going to pick fights and engage with Trump, allowing Trump to become a victim, right. rightfully, much like the Mar-a-Lago raids galvanized mm. Trump's support with Republicans. 
trumping unfairly and from our viewpoint attacked by the democratic establishment ruthlessly mm -hmm. allows this to become a two-person general election fight um hardening trump's support that might have thought to defect so i actually think the democrats could be trump's greatest asset to get through this primary the other thing i would add to that though i know that like we're not talking about this but i think it's going to be looming in the political air for uh some time is abortion like trump's supreme court nominees or you know a Appointees are why Roe was overturned. And I think that is something we saw people underestimated it. Um, this election is something Democrats can keep using and they can tie that to Trump. He can say, you know, whatever he wants. And, you know, I saw the reporting that he thought it was silly or that it would hurt Republicans. But at the end of the day, like you can draw a straight line from him changing the balance of or at least putting more of his folks on the courts and, and that decision coming and every decision that comes after that, that like really gets Democrats, not only Democrats, but like Democrats, independents and moderate Republicans, um, gets them feeling like, are we gonna keep getting things taken away because the type of person that Trump is? Now, any Republican would have appointed these folks, um, but Trump is the one who did it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that Democrats can also go back to. Yeah, it to. is a new era when the Supreme Court is taking things away. American voters aren't yeah. used to that. You know, if I were advising him, I, I think I'd say, Mr. President, I think you should take some advice from someone who I know you deeply admire, George Wallace, and say that there's not a dime's worth of difference between these two political parties and run against both of them at once. You know, because, and, and by the way, you can do that most successfully as an independent in this race. <laughs> yeah, well, I, wanna, I, wanna, I was waiting. Okay. I love that. See you later. See you later. See you that later. was going to be my big finish. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and then we'll go to questions, so get ready if you have some. But on the way to that, just on this whole thing of the, the, the contempt of the Democratic establishment helping him, and the Democrats being just fine with that, let's throw him gasoline, you know, on the theory of he's who would prefer to run against. Trump gets indicted. Help or hurt his nomination. Corinne? You know, I... Yeah, hard again, to know. It's, it's hard to know. We, you know, this, like I said, Trump's very nuanced. There's what you know to be true and what has always happened historically, and then there's Trump. Yeah. Yeah. And nothing touches it. And at, it's, up he's, until now. Yeah. and so um, I, I don't know. It could, it could go either way. I think he, one of the reasons he's announced as a candidate now hmm. is any defense lawyer, I've been told, will tell you that. The one thing the Justice Department hates to do is meddle with an election. Remember Comey and Hillary yes. and all that? <laughs> they didn't around. meddle at they're, all. They're kind of programmed <laughs> to like not want to meddle. So now he's a candidate. I think his troubles are too big for that, and they're going to meddle. But he can say, see, the minute I announce for president, they try to shut me down with a phony left-wing indictment conspiracy and you know, cut to an hour. I think it depends what the indictment is. Yeah. You know, if it's for uh, holding classified documents, uh, yeah. yeah, his base probably says that was unfair because it's unequal application of the law to right. other people who've done similar things. Yeah. If it's something worse, I think it feeds into Republicans' concerns about viability that this could hurt him in a general election. So it just depends, I feel like. You, you know, it could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So, you know, and people, because he's just sick of it. There's yeah. just too much of it. And that may really help people to say, you know what, I, I got to move on. So. All right, the big final question. His threat will clearly be if, if they steal the primary from me, because, you know, we know they steal general elections, you, you mega patriots. They steal the primary. I might just have to run as an independent candidate. The hell with all of them. Do we think he'd really do it? And if so, would it be, would it be as big as people think? Or would he just shrivel into, and then, you know, would it, would, it, would it have a short half-life and become uninteresting? like most independent candidates have been. I mean, it's tough because his thirst for vengeance will be right up against his penchant for laziness. Yeah. <laughs> right? And it's like, it's a fair, it takes a lot. Storm. You got to get on the ballot. And, all that. You know, that's a, that's and then a you're a third place loser, though, too. <laughs> you know, that's a hard one. I did a Twitter poll for a new hostile nickname, and the winner was Mara Loser. Uh, you know, and um, uh, we will see. I think he'll threaten, threaten enough that he'll put himself in the middle of the story. Let's get some of your yeah. questions about the next presidential or any other election. We should talk about the Senate. One reason I don't think Mitch McConnell's crying himself to sleep is his enemy, Donald Trump's bleeding on the carpet. And he has a great calendar in 2024 for the R. So mm -hmm. we can talk about those races too. Why don't we start with you, man? 
Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, so in the past three elections this year, 2020 and 2018, young voters have turned out at significantly larger um, levels than they typically do. Do you see this do you see this trend continuing into 2024 and how might it affect um, candidates campaigns? I I just I spent all of this year being so annoyed at all the people who were like young people are not going to show up. They showed up two elections in a row like 2018 was a midterm um, and yeah, I just had a lot of faith in you all. So um, thank you for showing up. I do think it's something now that it's been three elections in a row that um, campaigns are going to have to start to consider, like, what are the priorities of or what are the issues that they're talking about so often, especially you think about, um, you know, DeSantis being in Florida, there's a lot of older people there. Typically, if you talk about the issues that older voters care about, that will bring them out and you're fine. But now that young people um, are, are showing up more, like the things that they want are going to have to be taken into consideration. Um, and there's, I don't think it's a de decision as to whether people will do that or not. Like if they don't, I, I don't think that they're going to be successful um, in their elections. But there's just going to have to be a lot more thoughtfulness because um, I did a panel last weekend. Um, there's going to have to actually be an investment in young people. Um, some people made that investment this time, others did not, and I think the people who made that investment benefited. But if people are not thoughtful about actually engaging them, they will vote, but whoever engages them, I think, is where, where I think folks will I, I would well, agree. One problem that Republicans have, I think, is you know they've been losing 18 to 29-year-olds for a while. In the 2010 red wave when Republicans won, they won 30 to 44-year-olds. In this last election that we just had, Democrats won 30 to 40 year, 44 year olds by 12 points. So they have now lost the millennial yeah. generation that is aging into being their 30s and 40s, as well as Gen Z. And both of those generations combined are going to make up more than half of the electorate mm -hmm. in 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah, historically, younger voters in the midterm have turned out less than they do in presidentials. Mm -hmm. This was a curve bend this time. And we still have to wait to get precincts to really know. It was an early hit, hint in the New York 19 special where the college towns were through the moon and the Democrats won a bit of an upset there. Mm -hmm. So as long as we have these culture wars with the Dodd decision being, I think, at the vanguard of it, it looks like, like young people are deciding to participate in off-year elections, which is very bad news for the current demographic formulation of the Republican Party, as we just saw. Mm -hmm. Sir. So I'm an FC grad, but I'm also a Texan. All right. And, and uh, I see a lot of parallels in, in this off-term election between uh, 2000, okay? You had two governors in 2000 that did extraordinarily well, Jeb, your guy, and, and W in Texas. And, they, and W was able to use it as a springboard. DeSantis looks a lot like Bush did. He, they both had Hispanic votes they both had big victories used it as a springboard jeb is nicer but anyway keep going <laughs> well i have a question mainly for john because you're from dallas yeah. uh what about governor abbott he had a big night too he did yeah i mean governor abbott's popular in the state of texas uh he showed i think he demonstrated uh to resist tacking too hard to the right in a primary he's a skilled campaigner um, arguably, you know, Beto O'Rourke uh, is an expert at failing upwards. Uh, he's a <laughs> horrible candidate, so we don't really know. Um, look, I, I'm sure if you ask the governor, uh, he's he's eyeing the White House. Um, he might throw his hat in the ring. I'm not sure that he he has enough. Uh, he's given enough yeah. catnip to the base to get there. Um, but he certainly he has power now, and you know, one of the top issues in a Republican primary is the border. So if he decided to take an incredibly bold stance, that might be kind of how he carves out his his lane going into 2024. Yeah, if you're governor of Texas, you can ante in because you got a money base and you got yeah. a voter base if you want to. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. Well, thank you all. Uh, Tad, you mentioned exit poll. So to mm -hmm. the panel, what exit poll data surprised you? I know we talk about Dodds, but where's the other things that surprised you? Well, there was a question in the exit polls about whether or not democracy is threatened in the United States. And, you know, a, a very large, I think it was 63% of the people said they thought it was threatened in the United States. And the interesting thing to me was 50% were Democrats and 48% were Republicans. Okay, so, so this idea that democracy is under threat is beginning to take hold <clears throat> with a large 
segment of the electorate. When you look at almost all the other issue-related questions in the exit poll, you know, whatever the number is, it's divided. The Democrats are in one place, the Republicans are in a different place, you know, as you go all through the different issues in the exit poll. So I was surprised to see that much awareness and, and, and view that there is a real threat to democracy. And I was more surprised to see that it coexists between the parties. I think there's a lot there, and I think it's a, a lot of the explanation about what happened last Tuesday. Just on polling real quick, because it came up in the earlier panel, but so did 2024. So I'm going to do I'm going to just get into it for a minute because it drives me crazy. The thing is, oh, all the polls were wrong. What's wrong with the polling? Well, polling is very hard to do now, but the purpose of polls is not to be a therapy animal for partisans <laughs> on both sides to make them feel better about who's going to win next month. That's what people use it for. I better see what Nate Silver thinks. Oh, thank God, Herschel Walker's down five. I can relax. He's up four. I'm moving to Portugal. <laughs> you know, it, it, that's not what polls are for. What we use polls and campaigns to do is get inside the voter's head to find out what they're interested in and how we can introduce new information mm -hmm. to maybe on election day or election week with mail-in ballots have an impact. So polls are not to let you tell the future, Kreskin. That's really not what they do. So, you know, buyer beware if you try to use polls to know what's going to happen in two weeks. Voter history tells you the most, and then polls are good for tracking the issue issues. Agenda. By the way, the great hint, election night, when the networks like to tease the exits, well, we're finding out, whoop, that abortion is the second biggest issue. Yeah. In all the polls, it was the third by a big margin, weak third. What does that tell you? It tells you that the polls were missing abortion voters. Who are the most, what's the most pro-choice cohort? Younger, mm -hmm. and the very most young men, 18 to 34, who normally don't show up very well in midterms. What that showed you was, holy hell, they're showing up good for the Democrats. That was the first early hint. But careful about ballot questions, trying to be using them to predict the future, because until right before the election, they're, they're not so predictable. Yeah, can, can I just say one thing about yeah. that? The, you know, I did a race in my home congressional district, Rhode Island, too, which we were behind in every single mm -hmm. poll. The public polls, the private polls, there was no way to win. And in the last poll that we did, we were, we were still behind, 47 to 41 behind, okay, three wow. weeks out from an election. And, and yet the poll gave us guidance as to what frame was best. And we moved to a frame that we were only losing by three points, okay? Because <laughs> we were losing all the other frames by a lot more. And that proved to be the way that we were able to break through in the end, because that's what the poll is. It's a roadmap, okay? And you know, if, you t if it gives you the right directions, you can get there. The poll also said, tell Ted to quit going door to door and irritating his neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we won 72% of the vote in Block Island, where I live. Hey, okay, congratulations. So <laughs> um, it seems like Donald Trump's political superpower is his connection to his base. And this connection is based off of this idea that everybody else is against you, but I'm with you. And whether that be Republicans, whether that be Democrats, whether the media, how as a Republican do you go against that? What's the effective thing, not only for Republican leaders, but Republican voters who are with Trump to attack him in a way that doesn't make them more likely to be with him and turn him into a martyr? Well, just quickly, his base, we know, yeah. is 25 to 30 percent smaller than it was four months ago. Bases can shrink. Nothing works in American politics like winning, <laughs> and nothing fails like losing, particularly when your brand is the invincible winner. Right. They're more than happy to give him a gold watch and name the RNC building after him and move on. So I, I think that super glue thing is what's going to be tested now by losing. And that's going to be it. You want to win or you want to lose? You want socialism yep. or you want this? That's the that's the fault line. We'll see what happens. But anybody else? Sorry, I didn't mean to butt in. Yeah, I guess I don't really understand your question. Are you asking for as Republican leaders? Are we going to go against it? Maybe no. Like like John, you're running the super PAC yep. for Ron DeSantis. Yep. So you got to thread this needle now of attacking Trump from within the party. How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, 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 first of all, <laughs> right. we're, we're seeing that seismic shift in real motion before we've even uttered a word on the super PAC side. So that may just be happening. 
Um, but I, th I think the answer is, if it's Governor DeSantis and his allies like us making that, making that argument is, you get your Trumpism, the, somebody who looks out for the got, forgotten man, somebody who's competent, somebody who can put together the coalition, but all of that, but a winner. So we're essentially saying we are Trumpy, but we're a winner. Um, and Trump, and it's, it's gonna be fascinating to see as this evolves, I can't wait to actually kind of dig into some research on this, but I think the magic sauce will not be necessarily saying, from a never Trumper standpoint, just personal attacks. It's going to be Trump was incredible. We're so grateful for Trump as a party elder, not a party leader. It's time to look toward the future. And that future has to be about winning, particularly with college educated white women that just are so repulsed by, by Donald Trump, the man that they can't hear our Republican agenda. I think that's a conversation that has to be had. Um, I think we're seeing that shift, but you know, time will tell. I, I yeah. think as, as a party leader that I, I'm, I'm in a really good position where I don't have to get into that minutia. <laughs> I just can sit back and watch it all play out because in the end, I'm, I'm going to support whoever the, the nominee is. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Ah, thank you for being here and thank you for having us here today. I have things swimming around in my mind. Uh, I, an accumulation of questions from the whole day. So the topics I'm interested in are your comments on messaging, uh, messaging for the Democrats especially, mm -hmm. because I, as somebody said earlier, the Republicans seem to have done a lot of fear-mongering messaging mm -hmm. without solutions, without offering solutions. There was fear-mongering. Yeah. What about the Democrats? Because they really did seem to fall down with messaging and what are your ideas about what needs to happen going forward? And then the other thing I've been thinking about is the influence of Uvalde. And has anybody thought about that and you know, gun safety and all of that? I haven't heard a lot about that. And the third thing is Nikki Haley as a candidate. Well, there's a lot of stuff here. Let's, let's break it up. All we state, if the, Demo the best issue the Democrats have is Donald Trump. If he goes away, what's your message? We'll start with John and uh, yeah. I mean, I, I know that the media narrative was the Democrats either don't have a message or the Democrats are too focused on democracy or abortion. When I went out and sort of campaigned with some of these candidates, you, the, the actual campaigns the Democrats were running were much different. And they would say, look, the Republicans talk about fighting inflation. They have no plan to fight inflation. What we've been doing in Congress is we've been taking on the prescription drug companies to lower costs. We've been taking on the big oil companies to lower energy costs. Um, they want to, they say they're gonna try to fix inflation. What they're really gonna do is get in power and criminalize abortion. And they're gonna take away your freedoms. And what we're gonna do is the job's not done yet, but we're gonna keep fighting special interests on behalf of you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that message in, in purple states with moderate candidates, with more progressive candidates, really resonated and worked. Yeah. yeah I I, yeah, I completely agree. Like there was a message. Everyone didn't have the same message. And I, I think that as more people have grown interested in national politics, they want Democrats to have just this one overarching message. But one message is not going to, I mean, one underlying message, yes. But there's not a specific message that every candidate can take around to their specific state or district that's going to be successful. Um, and, and I think I would say that like, Democrats did nationally talk about abortion a lot. They got a lot of pushback for it, that it wasn't something people cared about, but I think they trusted their instincts and they were right. So I don't, I think the media has told us Democrats suck at this, but as we saw on Tuesday, they must not suck that bad, you know, <laughs> for able to win some elections. I think the Democratic message needs to be focused on economic issues, core economic issues, particularly uh, you know, job, I mean, the president has a remarkable record in job. He created 10 million jobs since he, he's come into office. It's unprecedented. But wages, on the other hand, are not keeping up with the cost of living. We need to fight on that. Health care is an economic issue. Education is an economic issue. We need to take all of the issues, and right now we've got a lot of issues. Climate is over here. That's an environmental issue. No, it isn't. It's an economic issue. It's about building a future economy that deals with this here in America where we're going to keep the jobs. And I think if we take everything and we push it into the prism of core economic issues, and then we tell people that we will stand up to powerful interests on their behalf, and we will be on the sides, on their side in the fight that mattered to them. You know, that's where we need to go. And if we stay there, 
you know, I think we can win elections everywhere. Ted Devine for DNC chair. <laughs> um, sir. Hi, um, I have a question. Voters tend to like unique candidates. If you go back 45, 50 years, they like that one guy who's unique. When Obama started running, nobody thought he was going to win. And then he ended up becoming president. Um, we had a peanut farmer in the 70s who became president. Nobody, nobody thought that Trump was going to be, become the nominee when you had the 16 other candidates in the primary. So there seemed to be um, an affinity for that unique one guy who stands out among all the candidates. Maybe that's what the Republicans need this, in 2024. Uh, well, we're talking to the Kardashians. <laughs> well, not not only that, but I mean, a lot of these, a lot of the um, people who become presidents are like reaction to the previous yeah. president. No, no, I believe that, that yeah. there there is an appetite for uncola candidates. When Fetterman started, I said this thing's either going to blow up on the launch pad because he's too liberal, or the fact that he doesn't look like anybody in politics uh, is going to be rocket fuel. It's going to work really well mm. for him. And you saw it with Arnold here. What people liked most about Arnold was he had nothing to do with politics. I mean, I did that campaign and we do focus groups. With people where I don't think he can find Sacramento on a map, but it doesn't matter. He's got a driver. And when the Hummer <laughs> limousine pulls up in front of the Capitol, Arnold's going to get a rocket gun out of the trunk and blow the damn place up. And for him, <laughs> and Bernie had a little of that. Oh, Can't yeah. work a hairbrush, but you know, yeah. he's interesting. <laughs> Caught on with the kids, right? right? Yeah, right. you yeah. did. He sure so, did. Well, in the yeah. Bernie in the Bernie case, uh, Jim Clyburn took care of that because mm -hmm. the Democrat didn't want Bernie as their nominee. Right. No. 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 It the the Uncola thing doesn't always work, but in a world where people are so cynical. Something that feels like if you can fake authenticity, oh, you're going places in politics because that's what they're looking for. Because we've taught them not to trust the category anymore. Politician equals liar. So if you are seen different, you get interesting. Whether you can parlay that all the way, a lot of bumps on the road. And Trump had that. Mm -hmm. I mean, people thought the real reason they elected Trump was they thought he could untangle Washington and get stuff done. Mm -hmm. I mean, he sat in that boardroom. And he fired Gilbert Godfrey for not selling enough snow cones. He's a can-do guy. Now, they don't know the boardroom is made out of cardboard. Sure. It's fake. Sure. And Gilbert was paid to be there. And he got fired because he had concert dates. And the producer said, oh, this week you're firing Gilbert. Yeah. That's how The Apprentice really worked. Well, he had all that TV coverage. You know. Right, right. Perception is reality. And yeah. that's really what's happened in our politics. Mm, sure. Pop culture has invaded it. Yes. Because we don't have Anzio Beach or the Great Depression to worry about. So now we can kind of play at politics for entertainment. You know, the next candidates are going to be on a party bus throwing white wine at each other. And Andy <laughs> Cohen will be refereeing the whole thing. I, 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 Mike, I love the fresh new face that the Democrats chose in 2020 to be their nominee. Just a bright new star nobody had heard of in But politics. you see, that's true. But he was fresh because he was. So here's the theory. And this is unfair fresh to all the, the candidates. Left. But we start out with George W. Bush. Great guy. You want to have a beer with him. And I'm doing the voter perception, not what I I would like to have a beer with him. I like it. But, mm -hmm. And then by the end of it, they thought, he's a moron. He can't talk. We got to get rid We need a genius, mm -hmm. like a law professor, <laughs> and somebody who can really talk, or at least hires this guy. Mm -hmm. So bingo, Barack Obama, the mm -hmm. brilliant orator, incredible, hope, best thing to sell, hope and new. Cut to four years or eight years later, red line, they're jumping all over. This guy's weak, weak, mm -hmm. weak, weak. We need the tough business guy who fired Gary Busey. Mm -hmm. Let's get him. <laughs> He's not part of politics. So now, now, then, boy, this guy's wearing us out. Mm. He, he's stone cold crazy. We're going to invade Canada with this guy. I can't stand the TV news anymore. So I want a nice, comfortable old shoe. Somebody who I don't have to worry is going to run everything. My kids can watch the news again. We can just all relax. Good old Joe. Now, what I would worry about if I were Biden is, Joe's 148. I can't remember where the White House is. We need JFK. We need a young, fresh, good-looking guy from the future. Where does everything in America happen first? California. You got any bright, young, telegenic, good-looking, future Silicon Valley hovercraft guys around? In a general election, in a primary, I think he's got trouble. That could be the mainspring, which is why a DeSantis is much scarier to Biden mm. than a Trump or mm -hmm. any of the new. Yes, sir. Sorry for my long spiel there. No, no, you had me laughing. <laughs> um, I was driving to San Francisco a few weeks ago, and I from like Bakersfield 
for about the next 200 miles. I kept seeing signs yeah. along the five freeway bashing Newsom. I mean, and I know these were probably coming from farmers. Um, if perception is reality, I always thought that that was pretty much Democrat, all the Central Valley. So maybe to Corinne, yeah, we got an expert know, right here. Water. Go ahead. I think it was all based on water. And yeah, in District 13, I, the person who's running for, I think John he actually, Doherty. Yeah, I went to school with him. And, He's and, an amazing man. Okay. Well, it makes, okay. makes well, one of us. <laughs> He's very knowledgeable on water issues. Let's he, is, he is. He is. is. I hope he doesn't win. But anyways, um, but am I perceiving this wrong? I mean, is it just straight Republican all the way up? Because I was kind of shocked by the signs went on for 200 miles. Yes. And five years ago, it was probably the same signs I've seen. So, so the... The recall of Gavin Newsom happened in the Central Valley. The majority of the signatures for the recall Gavin Newsom came from the Central Valley. Uh, and the recall actually people throughout the Central Valley by and large voted to recall Gavin Newsom. He is not popular in the Central Valley. And yet it is because of the water issues. It's uh, because of the cost of living. And our farmers are very unhappy with the level of, I guess, well, the non-attention they've received from Gavin Newsom. Uh, once the recall was finalized, I, I, I was interviewed a lot and I always said that because as soon as the recall is finalized, Gavin Newsom hightailed it through the Central Valley and was going around and, and I, I refer to it as his apology tour because he's not well liked. So that's why, you know, in the Central Valley, and I'm really glad that you asked this question because Throughout the Central Valley, a lot of the Democrats that you don't really hear about, you know, um, they have a race to, I always call it a race to the middle. And a lot of them are like, oh, forget party. Don't pay attention that I'm a Democrat. Doesn't matter. I'm going to work with Republicans. And I always find it so interesting because in the state capitol, we are a severe minority, the Republicans. So I think, why are they campaigning on working with Republicans? The Republicans in the Capitol can't vote to move a pencil around. There's not enough of us. Uh, they We had to send so many cease and desist orders out to Democrats running locally throughout the Central Valley for using the Republican logo illegally on their flyers because they are trying to deceive Central Valley voters that they are Republicans or Republican-like or I may be a Democrat, but really on the inside I'm a Republican. So it's 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 a very different world when you go you know like you said through along the five so you've seen it yourself when you come from san francisco and you you hear Repo democrats they can you know talk about these issues and get be very bold but the democrats in the central valley are very quiet and they they really try to pretend that they're a republican yeah a lot of the issue up there is that those damn thirsty people in la county are taking all the water <laughs> that we need for almonds you know, you know, about a zillion <laughs> gallons per almond, but it's a fair so, fight. But he, she's I always he's say, talking. I always say, nobody's going to take this issue seriously until they go to Starbucks and there's no <laughs> almond milk for their coffee. Uh, uh, yeah, then right. that's when everyone in San Francisco <laughs> right. is going to go, wait a minute. <laughs> feel like oh, gas when that happens, about right. throat on that one. <laughs> Last question, ma'am. Okay, pressure. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, um, right. yeah, so I know we've talked a lot about like potential candidates and then also messaging, but I was really curious about what off your organizing looks like for the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party. I have a lot of friends that are part of their like local county Democratic Party, even in California. And I remember one of my friends had a conversation with their party leader and they said, oh, now that we've won the midterms, we're chilling until 2024. But how what are the different parties strategies for really continuing to engage voters and mobilizing them between 2022 and 2024 in the hopes of having a more maybe clear outcome in 2024. Maybe somebody from each party. Shaniqua, you want to take yeah. the votes? Or... Um, that's unfortunate to hear. Hi, Nivea. Um, <laughs> Nivea was one of our interns this summer. So, um, plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but um, that's sad to hear that anyone says they're just going to kind of hang out until 2024. But, you know, I can speak to what we're doing, and we're working with a lot of progressive organizations. So I think that in turn means that they are not taking a break. Um, but we're, you know, there's a ton of elections next year. They might not be federal ones, but there's a ton of elections happening. 
and we're going to give, well, we got to get through Georgia, and then we're going to give people a little break, and then we're just going to pull them back into those elections that are happening. So um, we're planning on working with Run for Something. They do a lot of down ballot work, um, deploying volunteers um, and, and raising money. But also, we want to start having, working with groups who are having conversations with voters now, like, what do you care about? And just starting to understand, you know, what is going to motivate them to to vote in 2024 and specifically to vote for Democrats in 2024. Um, so, you know, that looks like a lot of deep canvassing and just really taking time to talk to voters and understand what they want. Um, that's also about talking to people who don't vote typically um, and trying to bring some of those low propensity voters in, um, doing more around voter education, just, you know, and registering voters. That is something we did in 2021. Um, we got started in August, so it was a little late. We're going to get started a lot sooner this time. But we actually saw some of the work that we did in 2021. Um, I would say there's a direct path to the states that we were doing voter registration fundraising in into states that did very well um, and better than expected for Democrats this year. So um, that's what we plan on doing. And I hope you will tell all your friends, like, they should take a small break, but it's not like we're going to take a whole year off. <laughs> Either of you guys want no, to talk about You're Republican the official state? here. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, uh, the California Republican Party has made a significant investment when it comes to engagement. Uh, so we have, you know, I don't, a lot of people may not know this, but our board as it is, is incredibly diverse. So there's a lot that we have to overcome um, in terms of the stereotypes that are put upon us about mm -hmm. who we are. So we've, we're working really hard to dismantle those old stereotypes and really set ourselves apart in a way from um, the Republican Party. We were California Republicans. We're not necessarily Texas style Republicans. And the, the level of engagement that we have and that we've been implementing is just sort of historical for, for California and for, for Republicans as a whole. And what we've seen um, just in the last uh, election cycle um, a few weeks ago is that we're starting to close the margins on a lot of races. So we still aren't winning in, in certain areas, but the, the, the level of, um, of loss is not as great. We've sort of upped our percentage of, of how we're losing. So we're working you know, slowly to reach out to people and just to make sure that people know that we're not just gonna be around yeah. during election year and that we really care about the issues and sort of, you know, like I said, dispel the stereotypes and really get people to learn about our policies and why we're Republicans and what Republican um, policies and can do for you and help you in your life. Can I just add one? I'm not a Republican, obviously, but something <laughs> I have been impressed with that I saw at the beginning of this year, and I thought that's going to be a problem for us. And then I saw a few weeks ago a follow-up story on it, were these um, these like centers that were engagement the centers, engagement yes. centers. Yes, yeah. like that is yeah. I was blown away by it, and you know, it's just a place people can come. They can see who the Republican Party is locally, and you know, they're not as scary now when, when you step into um, those places and, you know, doing it in a lot of Latino um, we communities. We have Latino, we have yeah. um, Asian, we have Black. Yeah. I mean, if you, there, and we you know, that's really a that. testament to Ronna McDaniel <laughs> yeah. because she's done yeah. that throughout the United States and, and they're amazing. So, yeah. Let's have a big Thank hand you. for our panel here. Can I ask one more question about that? We're yeah, running late. You asked a very fast question. Yeah. We'll do a very fast answer. Yeah. Based on the engagement question that you just said, mm -hmm. um, how would you talk to people that are on the fence between the two parties but are turned off to what I would say is like a lack of compassion in terms of political stunts like the trafficking people to Martha's Vineyard or the $35 insulin cap, but you want to bring them in in a public dialogue and an engagement space? What would the argument between now and 2024 be to combat that sort of public image of a lack of compassion versus the National Party versus the California Republican Party? Well, and so California, so for one, we're Californians. So that's the first thing we we lead with. Like, you know, I don't, whatever Republicans are doing in Texas or Florida, it does not necessarily impact us. Um, and I guess what we mainly say is, are you happy with what you're seeing in California? Are you happy with the cost of living? Are you happy with the gas prices? Because if if you're not happy about any of those things, you can't blame the Republicans because 
we haven't gotten legislation passed in God knows how many huh. years. Right. So none of these things that impact your daily life have are because of us. Okay, I have to cut it off because we're out of time. Thank you, panel. We're going to have a 10 to 15 minute break. <laughs>